There's no worse call out than when you try to put the Breathe Right nasal strip on your nose and it literally will not adhere because your face is so greasy. Oh, yeah, it's <laughs> awful. It's the ninth circle of hell. I tried one once for snoring um, and it, it had no effect, according to Rachel. Like, none whatsoever. <laughs> oh. And then I read that they're apparently, it, it's not agreed that they actually help with that at all. When I still lived with my parents, I lived in the basement of our very poorly converted house and so it was black mold <laughs> this everywhere is in ohio yeah and so like if i would wear a breathe right strip i would be sick the next day like if i wore it in my sleep i would really? be like, nauseous and horrible oh, Just, jory. i was probably breathing in like unbelievable mold. like xenon or whatever mold I boy what the... jory griffiths <laughs> There's all kinds of weird toxins and chemicals that I feel like people who lived in like the 60s and 70s are aware of that never get talked about anymore. Like I was breathing in like fluoride halon oh, gases dude. that were killing my Try brain growing cells. up in New Jersey. Are you serious? What about New Jersey? Oh my God. So in my town, Pompton Lakes, apparently, this what I'm about to say might be legally actionable, although I hope not. Uh, there was a chemical company, which I think is... Uh, is there a Mark Ruffalo film about this story you know that's what? being released? <laughs> there, there really should be something like that because I think there's, and I'm not an expert on this, in my exact town, according to some investigative journalism I read semi-recently, there's been, there was an unusually high cancer rate. And, it, you know, sometimes fluctuations happen, right? It's very difficult to determine causality. Sure. But also it was apparently known that there was some unethical dumping and things like that going on with the the chemical company. So, like, did is it actually, you know, the cause and effect thing? Who the hell knows, right? Yeah. It's really, really unclear. But certainly a lot of people where I grew up got pretty fucked up forms of cancer. Brian... <laughs> Can you please, like, do me a favor and not die? I'm trying. That would be great. I'm trying not to. My goal is not to. That's such a sweet thing to say. <laughs> Shory, I also hope you don't die. Wow, I was fishing for it, and it <laughs> came well, true. It's late in night, episode two, everybody, and we are actually recording. I think we're beyond the test audio phase of, yeah. of recording, and we've already, 30 seconds in, we got into cancer. I mean, <laughs> which, yeah. which is great. <laughs> Last episode, it was child murder. This episode, cancer. Cancer. Just lots of fun stuff in the store for those first yeah. five minutes of the episode. It's really a, a compelling advertisement for the live shows where we <laughs> where we get into this stuff. There's a specter of inevitability hanging over the whole thing. Yeah, that's me, baby. <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> so uh, we have a special guest today on, uh, on on only our second episode of Layton Night, but already we're, we're hitting a high point oh, because no. Layton, do you want to introduce our? You've heard his voice. So the uh, first official guest for Leighton Night is very exciting because uh, he was a part of our live shows and he is a very dear friend of ours as well as a narrative designer on Dream Daddy. He's very talented. Also, you might recognize him from the 10 Minute Power Hour on Game Grumps. Uh, we have Jory Griffiths with, with uh, fuck. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Jory. I did that great build up and then I... We're, we're, I'm not oh. editing this out. Yeah, it was a pretty, uh, it was a pretty natural like ending for that build. It, it, I liked it. It's Jory Griffiths. Hello, gamers. <laughs> Jory <Jervie> Griffiths. <laughs> yeah. All right, I accept it. Joris. It's like uh, in the ballpark. Jory, thank you for coming over and doing this. I'm so happy to be here. Because uh, what are we what are we talking about today? We're talking about movies. And I know that you have opinions on, on movies. Yeah, I'm a real... Uh, a real cinematiste. I just couldn't think of anything to say about <laughs> What's it. Because it word all th felt so disingenuous. Isn't there... There was a fancy French word for someone who loves cinema. What is it? Uh, something like... It's, oh, I'm, it's asshole? It's killing me, right? <laughs> it's something... C cineast, right? Cineast, yeah, right? Cine yeah, cineast, as we say. Yeah. Yikers. I guess that sounds better than cinephile. cinephile. Well, they all oh, yeah. sound sexual. Like, <laughs> I mean, cineast is more juvenile sexual, but it still sounds I like I mean, it. I guess for the kind of person who would self-identify with that, maybe it is sexual where it's just watching um, Nicholas Winding Reffin's Drive Dick in Hand, which oh, I yeah. think is the only way people just watch that specifically movie. Specifically watching the Christina Hendricks death scene that's like super fetishistic. Yeah, it's, it's like, hey, let's motion. explode her head. Yeah. I haven't seen that because I so read fun. about, I know it's so good, right? But no, or no, do you God, that? fuck that movie. Oh, you hate it? This is okay. okay. We're we're getting right off the bat with <laughs> right. my hottest but, film. Right. <laughs> Let me tell you why I haven't seen it because I cannot handle realistic violence in movies. Mm -hmm. And I read about the scene where Albert Brooks, who I love, cuts the guy's arm. Yeah, and it sounded too upsetting to me. And I was like, now I can't see the entire movie because that one scene bothers me. Well, that's that's one of those deaths that is like, um, it's clearly being shot. Don't get me wrong; it's very the, the violence feels very fetishistic, but it's it's more for tragedy than for anything else. Cause like you just like introduce a nice old man character who then dies in a way that feels super plausible. 
Yeah. Yeah. But I want to hear your take on it, Layden. What okay. You say? Every film bro, and I self-identify as a film bro, every film bro <laughs> loves Drive 2011. It's a glorified music video. Reffin should have stuck with music videos. Oh, wow. It's so dog shit, and I truly cannot. It's like just because you used, used pink and blue gels doesn't make your movie good. Like, who do you we, think you are? We really got into a hot take right off the bat. This is great. Also, this, why this did is you, the one that I get into fights about. Why did you qualify it as Drive 2011? Is there a contradictory drive? Well, there's license to drive, the Corey Feldman, Corey Hart uh Corey Haim? Sorry, Corey Haim. We both cocked our heads to from, the side when you started talking it's from, about it's from It's from the 80s, from my youth. You, you're too young for it. Sorry, my friend. So, License to Drive with the Corys. Big double Corey movie from the 80s. That's probably <laughs> the other one. I feel like one. I, I, I compulsively like try to remember the date that a movie came out and then always drop it after the, the you know name of the movie, like the thing, 1982. Th- that's the ultimate film bro move. Because it makes it funnier when you're doing a bit. <laughs> <laughs> You were you were in no tangible way doing a bit. <laughs> my life is a bit, Jory. You should know this by oh, now. I that's Jory's autobiography. My life is a bit. <laughs> Wait, Brian. And it's me legit, like ugly crying. <laughs> um. So Brian, uh, with doing this show, I don't understand why we don't have a soundboard already. But you happen to have oh. a very special soundboard. You know what? For our good friend Jory here. I do. I've had this for I think three years now Hold yeah on. i think so it's under my uh, yes my iphone is organized into folders and this is under the entertainment folder <laughs> <laughs> i mean you're that's, right that's like the biggest privilege i've ever had in my life <laughs> okay now i can't remember which which it is i believe it's oh, is it this one that's a good bit yep that's a good bit that's a good bit you guys didn't have to bring bit. me here you could you could have just pulled <laughs> that thing out bit. And then we're like, yeah, I just thought A Quiet Place was a garbage film. And then... That's a good bit. <laughs> but it's not a bit. I've heard you espouse that opinion many times. That's a good bit. Thanks. <laughs> okay, now I have to bring this out constantly. Yeah. You're right, you can go. Huh? You can leave. Oh, yeah, we okay. have, we have fine. I get it. We solicited questions for this one. Why don't we just dive into them? I mean, I don't have anything yeah. else to say before we start uh, answering people's questions. Let me... Yeah, you know, I've, I've just been sitting here... No thoughts, head end, head empty. A smart broadcaster would have uh, pulled these up before we started recording, which I didn't do, so now i got to find them. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to kind of go through. Uh, th- this, is a, this is a light one. This one's from Hannah. Hey, Hannah, Hannah says, she says, I have certain go-to movies that whenever I'm having a bad day or feeling down, I, I automatically put on. What's yours? This is a good way to start, right? Like, yeah, I like that. It's Interesting. A, right, what's, what's your feel-good movie? That's a tricky answer because I feel like I have this weird thing with movies where I they don't have a lot of I can't think of a good way to put it. They don't have a lot of like inertia with my affections where mm-hmm. like I feel like I tend to move past movies really rapidly. Mm-hmm. And so that's like, why they're called movies. <laughs> that made me smile Boom. real big. It wasn't <laughs> audibly perceptible <laughs> to the audience, but I liked it. Um, as a kid. I there was like a period of several years where I had a tape of Monty Python and the Holy Grail mm. that I had taped off of the History Channel. I think you're the first white person to ever watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I wasn't saying it like it was special. I set up a context that made it clear that I didn't think it was. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, it, uh, is, you know it what? is a documentary, which is yeah. why I was on I, the History Channel. I, I have to learn, and this is something I'm working on, is to not say something bitty. <laughs> In order to intentionally derail someone's emotional point. So, Jory, <laughs> I apologize. Please continue. Brian, you're the best, and I appreciate you're the your best. provocation. <laughs> uh, it, it, it feels like there's a Fuck certain Fuck both of you. Talk about the movie. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, Monty Python. That that movie was, like, really important to me for a long time, and I, I watched it, like, there was a period where I probably watched it, like, three or four times a week. And it's, like, as a result of that, it's, like, that is the first thing that, like, deep recesses of my brain thought of when I heard Hannah's question. But... I basically can never watch that movie again as a consequence of it having been so important. Totally. To me. totally. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 I have a really hard time giving an answer to that question. Uh, does anybody have a concrete one that they can think uh, of? For me, it's who framed Roger rabbit. Interesting. For sure. I love who framed Roger rabbit. I've seen it. I don't even know how many times, possibly hundreds. It's just, I find everything about it. Wonderful. The acting's great. The animation's great. I think it's legitimately funny. Uh, I love Christopher Lloyd, Bob Hoskins, uh, just everyone in it. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, when I it's... saw that, I saw the movie in the theaters when I was 
whatever, 13, I can't remember exactly when it came out. If it was 88, I was 13 probably. And that opening scene when they transition from the 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 short into the live set like broke my brain <laughs> and still to this day is one of the like holy shit movies can do anything moments from from my life i don't remember the order in which i saw these movies but there were like occasionally still tapes coming out when i was a kid that uh and i might even just be thinking of gremlins 2 which explicitly oh, did best. it as a reference where so like good. they would start with like a looney tunes cartoon as like a pre-roll yeah yeah and i think that that's what they were playing on with that opening scene totally. of who framed roger rabbit and like in my memory it like I think I was really excited by stuff like that, where it's got this like meta edge to it, where you're like, you're, that's that's what Gremlins Do is all about. Where yep. It's like we cut to Bugs and Daffy doing some bullshit in the middle of the movie. Yeah, but e- even just that idea of look at how realistic these animated characters look in this live action world, which now is almost hackneyed. Yeah, right. Yeah. That kind of combination. Richard but, Williams, R.I.P. That's the best. What about you, Layton? Um, I think my immediate go-to is Hot Rod, starring Andy Samberg. I've never seen it. Oh my God, Brian! It's. I think the thing that um makes it so wonderful to me is that like I get I I just like can't watch comedies anymore, or at least like modern comedies because they try so hard to have a plot. It's like oh God, I with this you know end of the second act like babe wait that's I I can explain like I don't give a shit just give me bits and so hot babe rod, wait I can explain I love that <laughs> that is awesome I mean that that's like you know we need a super cut of that second that's, second act conflict oh, that's fucking great um babe but wait. but hot rod is <laughs> literally only bits the plot is just non-existent I mean it's you know it's a very basic plot but it's it's solely like that movie makes me laugh like no other movie does i would say also any john waters movie like mm-hmm. serial mom female trouble oh, it's, serial mom's the best oh it's amazing i i constantly think about matthew lillard yeah <laughs> saying hey dad have you seen henry portrait of a serial killer <laughs> <laughs> um i just remember the she's wearing white shoes after labor day scene oh it's the best it's so delightful um uh and then i think if i was going for horror stuff texas chainsaw you know easy that makes me feel very good and also texas chainsaw massacre the next generation which was renee zellweger's first right. role and also matthew mcconaughey yes. is in it classic yeah it's such a stupid movie and i love it so much yeah, i, I hadn't seen that movie until you showed it to me and it rules yeah nothing is i'm me at my most zen is watching leatherface chase a girl <laughs> around i just sit there and i'm like oh this is living uh, For- that movie has like the cast of like really fun like simply deconstructed but really humane characters that i really enjoyed they give the actors a lot of shit to do and it's that ending is so just like meaningless and bonkers like it ends on a non sequitur that doesn't go anywhere it's like, so smart uh, that was re- you said something interesting and i'm very interested in this non sequitur instead of non sequitur i think that's a very interesting accent a it, syllable you chose to accent is that on pretentious that. on my part no no it's just how you say it well because i'm pro- but, i probably should be saying it like non sequitur like or what I, there's, I don't think there's a right way but yeah. uh the accenting on that was was unusual enough that i took note of it in a proof non sequitur for, for horror evil dead 2 will be always way up there for me. i mean it, it is like who doesn't love evil dead 2 but yeah, those movies are really important it just never gets old it's so funny and great have you and i talked about ash versus evil dead you watched that show didn't you i did i liked it very much yeah yeah i like that show a lot too it, it doesn't quite solve the problems of like the latent misogyny that runs through those no, movies absolutely not. It, it didn't really do enough to subvert it aside from making ash a little more blatantly a scumbag right but that doesn't like it did it, 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 it did more solve the problem of the insane whiteness of the Evil Dead movies, yeah, to totally. some to some extent. I mean, not completely, but I felt like they were trying for to to be more inclusive um, in some in some way. Yeah, I think the uh, sidekick characters are really successful. Totally, I, I, I like them. What Dana and Pablo, right? Uh, Dana, name? it's her name is Dana De Lorenzo, the actor. Oh, Kelly, Kelly, Kelly and yeah, Pablo, yeah, yeah. right? Totally. Uh, yeah, I thought they were both great. I thought uh, Lucy Lawless was amazing. Lucy Bruce Lawless McCullough is... was great. Yeah, Bruce McCullough, oh, Bruce Campbell. <laughs> yeah. I do love Bruce McCullough also, yeah. but Bruce Campbell. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I thought it was genuinely, you know, it recaptured the kind of vibe of the Evil Dead movies and generally was I, I, just a fun, easy, easy watch. And some of the effects were great. Oh, too. the effects are consistently awesome. Like yeah. it's all, I imagine doing that stuff practically is cheaper than doing CG, but I, at this point I could be wrong. It yeah. might be cheaper just to hire an intern to and it was do a CG clearly thing, a but, mix too. Yeah. yeah. 
but yeah, some of the practical stuff, the scene in the morgue. When, oh, uh, yeah. I don't even know how, how blue Listen. is this podcast? Well, yeah, I don't think it matters, right? What do you think? I don't, go, go blue, my friend. There, yeah. there, there's, a, there's a scene in a uh, second season episode of Ash vs. Evil Dead where a corpse that has been partially, uh, what's the word for being morgified? Uh, morgified. Morgified. There's a corpse that's been like partially morgified, but not even close to completely. Is like is being dissected or yeah. autopsied or whatever. And I it, think it it comes to life. Like, yeah, Ooh, yeah, yeah. Yes. And like with no head or anything, it becomes a deadite. And um, it's like shit filled intestine, like is like and spraying diarrhea everywhere. Like wraps around Ash's neck and pulls his head up through the body's asshole, so that <laughs> Bruce's face is coming out of like its open chest cavity. Yep. And like it's all like. It's so like Looney Tunes. Like, it's tons so. This of fun. is like a reverse Ace Ventura kind of situation. Ooh. Oh, you're talking about Ace Ventura when nature calls yes. the birth scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's similar to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next next question. Uh, Layton, do you want to pick one, or should I just keep going at this? Um, I'd love to pick one, but I would need a moment so I can. Here, you can use my phone if you mm. want. It's riveting. So this question comes from Laura. What is your favorite David Lynch movie, and why? Why don't you start this one? Um, that's such a hard. We're not allowed to count Twin Peaks, right? Well, I like my answer was going to be Twin Peaks season three. According to Cahier du Cinema, the greatest <laughs> film of the 2010s. Is that true? Yeah, they they said that season three was the best film of the 2010s. I think I think that's a legitimate movie. take. Okay, okay. I think since we seem to be all unanimously on season three as a movie, and that that's our pick. We need to pick another movie. Okay, great. And we can we can circle back around to the return because you two are like the only two people in my life who have actually watched the return, which oh, drives me bonkers because you have to harass people into it. Yeah. It's the legitimate best. It's an eighteen hour well, commitment, but And I, I will say like that the script was clearly written to be how many was it initially? It was like thirteen apps. Oh, was it? I didn't and yeah, know that. so when they uh, it was around the time like they were David Lynch was about to drop out of the project because it wasn't getting enough budget. And he, like, probably as part of getting more budget, they just wanted more eps. And it feels like they didn't write more material to fill in for that. Because mm-hmm. there's, like, that middle episode stretch where, like, just nothing is happening. Like, that's, that's like, where the, like, three-minute-long floor-sweeping scene is. Where <laughs> Which they... I love. I, I, oh, I, yeah. I love it, too, in a way, but... It's not like I want plot out of Twin Peaks, but yeah. it's more just like. But oh honestly, boy. after episodes, whatever it was, 12 through 20 of season two, like I'll take that in the middle of season three. Hard agree. Anything. Yeah, absolutely. Anything other than James and Donna. Oh, God. Soap opera, whatever that. Yeah, no, thank you. All uh, right. So, Layton, what's your, your um, other Lynch pick? I'm going to say Blue Velvet. I would say Mulholland Drive, but Blue Velvet is like a perfect movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I own it on VHS, and I've been saving watching it on VHS for like a special occasion. And also, it was filmed in my hometown, so it's was it really? Yeah, Wilmington, North Carolina. I it's, didn't know that. It's very strange watching that movie because it's just like, oh yeah, I've been there. Um, oh, that's wild. Yeah, it's like, oh, this is down the street from where I worked at a screen printing shop in high school, and um, so so was uh, Stephen King's Maximum Overdrive. Oh my God, <laughs> oh. yes, please. Whoa, you haven't told me about that. that <laughs> yeah, I I didn't know this. I think it, I I had like locked it away in my brain, and then I finally watched it like drunk as shit on Halloween, and I was like, <laughs> what the fuck? All of this, like, I know exactly where all of this was, was oh. and I probably know like dozens of people who worked on it because my dad's in the film industry. I digress. I, that, that no, movie... but I I love hearing that. That's <laughs> Maximum Overdrive has like a weird hallucinatory quality where just like horrible movie but it keeps doing stuff that just doesn't feel like how movies work like yeah. the the one like she's not i think she might be the female lead when like at the end you she mean like, the truck yeah uh, uh, <laughs> that threw me for a second that would it, be christine <laughs> there's just like the moment where the woman comes out and is like we made you we made you oh. and then she gets shot and it's like she didn't have to do that and like her coming out and getting shot just isn't the kind of People thing that usually happens in movies dumb decisions so that movie you know, given like I was a young child, you know, born in 75. So the, the 80s horror kind of stuff, I was young enough to be terrified. I think we were talking about this maybe in the last time by VHS, uh, like cassette boxes or posters. I saw like ads for movies in the in the paper. I feel that. Uh, and that was one where I saw a preview for it or saw it. I can't even quite remember. But the idea of it fucking terrified me, terrified me. And then when I was like, I don't know. 
25 or something, I saw the movie and realized how much it sucked and was not at all scary. <laughs> and I was like, that's the shit that scared me. I, and I think yeah. there's something about being a kid in the eighties where you saw all these horror movie posters, which were like to a little kid, actually scary, but the movies were low budget crap that are funny when you actually watch them. Yeah, as yeah. Directed by a coked up maniac. Oh yeah, <laughs> totally. There's a, there's a prominent kill in that movie where it's like a baseball coach. And in my mind, it's like very like, I don't know, a phantasmagoric because like I don't know why there's this like vending machine that's like near oh, God. a little league. I remember hearing about this. Yeah, and like the the vending machine is like the coach in front of all of the kids is using the vending machine and then it like eats his money so he's like throttling it and then it shoots cans at him multiple times so that it like caves his head in and he dies and it happens in front of these kids. And as a kid, that scene was like really upsetting to me. And it, it got kind of lodged in my brain, so I realized I was kind of latently afraid of vending machines for a really long time. That's why this is called Latent Night. And eventually I played a <laughs> game called, uh, there's a game called Night Cry, where there's like a really prominent vending machine. What are you guys, what's happening? I just like that nobody laughed at that joke and just moved on. <laughs> tickled me so much <laughs> i'm sorry it felt mean i'm gonna apologize for that off mic it did what what you did felt mean yeah no once again i it made both of us laugh i interrupted your story with an unnecessary bit you're not the wrong one in this situation jory <laughs> i think did the previous time you interrupted uh, an emotional point with an unnecessary bit get cut is that going to end up in the final edit are people going to get we this reference know. we don't know uh but continue please <laughs> i'm sorry that once again i apologize for my behavior I accept. Thank you. All right. uh, it doesn't matter. There's a there's a game called Night Cry where in an opening cutscene a guy like dies because his like hand gets like pulled up into a vending machine, mm-hmm. and that's like the version of it that was really scary to me. But like it was interesting connecting those dots and realizing oh I'm kind of afraid of vending machines because mm. of awful pop culture and like Ramones wow. songs playing like it's the coolest thing. In the I love world. that. That's so specific. Oh, the, vending the, machines. the theme song for Maximum Overdrive. Yeah. I don't remember it. Wait, am I thinking of a different movie? Uh, you're. Th- I think you might be thinking of Pet Cemetery. Yes. Which is. Uh, I am thinking. What of is Pet the theme Cemetery. to? That? I don't. It's actually the Ramones. <laughs> I don't wanna be buried in a pet cemetery. I don't want to live my life again. And it's like. It's so sick. It's so earnest. I love that you sang that, and that was a pretty good Ramones impression too. Thank you. Also, I, I think the fact that I thought that that was for Maximum Overdrive, like I, I'm realizing <laughs> as you're talking about it that I don't remember shit about Maximum Overdrive other than being like, I lived there and also <laughs> Big Truck. I would like a recut of Maximum Overdrive set to the Initial D soundtrack. <laughs> set to the what? The Initial D soundtrack? So I don't I, even know what that is. I think having Initial D music on Maximum Overdrive turns the vehicles and the machines into the protagonist. <laughs> what, what, what is initial D? I don't know what additional initial D it's is. It's an, an anime and also like an yeah. arcade game about driving cars really fast. I've not seen a single episode. I've never played the game, but it's it's like Eurobeat music. The like really oh, famous cool. one is yep. running in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I, I was talking to Aaron last night. I forget why we were talking about Initial D, (laughs) but I found a mix that was like three hours Initial D soundtrack Eurobeat. And then like, you know, we sent it back and forth. And then, you know, 30 minutes later, Aaron was like, I've been listening to this this entire time. (laughs) Um, All right. I'll write that down to check out. Oh, it's it's delightful. Every song has the BPM of a panic attack. (laughs) Yeah, certainly. Wait, uh, you guys didn't answer the David Lynch question. Uh, Mulholland we, Drive for me, for sure. Yeah, that's that's. So if I can't say, say Mulholland Drive, that would be a hundred percent my first choice. My follow up would be Firewalk with Me. Oh which shit! Is really I saw it, and I would being a huge Twin Peaks fan, I saw it in the theaters when it came out. Then did not watch it again until I was preparing for season three, for by watching everything, and so revisited it after whatever twenty five ish years, right? Uh, and I was like, this rules. I, especially watching it, I think when I saw it in the theaters, it was, there was some distance between having seen the show and mm-hmm. having seen the movie. Watching it right after, like literally after the final episode of season two, getting into it, the continuity felt a lot more present than it did to me in the in the moment. And also, something that's really worth checking out, there are a million like deleted scenes from it that you can see on YouTube now. It was from some anthology or whatever, some DVD that they put out. 
and there's like extra Bowie stuff and it deepens and a lot of it shows up in the return as well. It really deepens the mythology and I thought a meaningful and interesting way. So I watched Firewalk with me and then all the deleted scenes and it was just a great experience. So two things. First of all, I retract my answer. Fuck Blue Velvet. Firewalk with me all the way. Um, it's a fantastic movie. Uh, B, I just bought it on Criterion Blu-ray mm. where they have the restoration of that like 90 minutes of content. Oh, great. I've been saving that one for a special Have you watched too, them yet? I have not watched them yet um, because I just, you know, you got to be in the mood to watch that movie um, yes. because it totally does the, and I, I, that's one of the things that I love about The Return so much is that it was like, this show has been flanderized by the public into being like, oh, it's cute and it's about diners and coffee and solving crime. And it's like, this is literally the darkest story on television. And I would straight up say the summary and I don't want to spoil it or trigger anybody, but it's the darkest shit in the world. <laughs> and like that movie just leans into it and Cher hard, Cheryl hard. Lee's performance. Like I, I'm on too many medications, so I can't physically cry anymore. But when I watched that movie, I was just like dry heaving, like with sadness yeah, he, it's great. Highly recommend. Yeah, <laughs> I, I feel like I'm interested in um, that was like right around the time David Lynch professionally was transitioning in like the he was still in the public eye because of like Elephant Man and Dune and shit. Mm -hmm. And then Fire Walk With Me was a film adaptation of a massive hit TV show. But it was also at the same time him like transitioning into what feels like the modern David Lynch right. career, which it probably Lost Highway is the first instance of really. Right? I still haven't seen Lost Highway. I Neither love have it. I. It's it, at the time I remember seeing it. I think it, I was in college. I went to see it with a group of friends. Everybody but me fucking hated it. Thought mm -hmm. it was insane nonsense. I absolutely loved it. Um, I thought uh, everyone was great. The the scene where. There's a great scene. I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, Bill Pullman talks to Robert Blake at a at a party. Robert Blake plays kind of a weird, ethereal, like man from another place type figure, uh, and it is a it, it's a wonderful scene just in its uh, just just as a standalone thing. Also, the soundtrack for that is and so the the like official movie album has a bunch of great stuff, including some Rammstein stuff. There's a, I think there's a Lou Reed song. There's a Bowie song. Whoa. There's a bunch of Bottlementi stuff, which is really, really great. Uh, the main character in the movie is a jazz saxophonist, and there's some really like interesting, cool jazz stuff. Uh, I, I love, love, love the soundtrack for, for that, too. Wow. Um, also worth mentioning, because Jory and I watched it recently. I mean, recently, I mean, like nine months ago. <laughs> um, but neither of us had seen Inland Empire. I've never seen Inland, Inland Empire. Maybe keep it that way. Yeah, that's what uh, everybody says. We're, yeah. we're both like diehard Lynch stands. Like, I will follow that man to the ends of the earth. I bought his like fat brick sized room to dream autobio that I've been slowly reading. Um, but that movie is incomprehensible even by his standards it's so and it's ugly. real long too right it's three hours and it feels like longer than that and i think i watched um perfect blue recently which mm. is a really really fantastic uh anime movie uh that uh executes that idea so much better of like oh she's an actress but you don't know what's a scene and what's yeah, yeah, yeah. The real life um anyway perfect blue watch it inland empire maybe don't watch it yeah, except did, for the rabbit stuff yeah, yeah everything good about inland empire is like and this also contributes a lot to the bloat of the runtime is like it's got like just like multiple little things that are taken from david lynch short film projects that mm. are just like squeezed mm -hmm. in and at the time that i saw inland empire the only thing the first time the only thing that stuck with me was the rabbits stuff and then it turns out that that is just inserts from a short film that he had made. Oh, really? Yeah, and yeah. it's like the short film is way more interesting. Did you both watch? What is it? What has Jack done? What did Jack do? <laughs> yeah, we watched it during lunch last it's, week. It's yeah. real fun. I really I, enjoyed it. I I think that it probably could use being seven to ten minutes shorter than it is because I feel like the joke plays itself out in the first few minutes. And what then it joke, really Jory? It's deadly serious. We've got yeah. something to talk. What about. did Jack yes. do? <laughs> um, like. That, but that actually specifically is something that I liked about it, which is I was on the verge of like being like, this is too long. And then I, I can't remember the specifics, so this is not a good thing. But I remember it winning me over again uh, just at the point where I was like, all right, let's wrap this shit up. Well, like he's trying to do like a gag where he's doing like the noir dialogue and then – the things that yes. sound like turns of phrase, like he's talking about, like, uh, I, I forget every word from that film already. Yeah. Like, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Tutata Bomb. Clear, clearly Tutata the star, Bonk. the star of the film. Uh, yeah. But like when when he's like, uh, I'd do anything for a chicken or a rooster. Like that, yeah, yeah. that stuff, like it's sort of trying to do a play where it's like, that sounds like something that would be said in a noir film, but he's literally talking about a rooster. And it's like, he sort of wins you back in the middle. And then the song is really cute and funny. The song was great. Yeah. yeah I love yeah. that. And Jory, did you buy that uh, vinyl of the song? I did. Yeah. You can uh, buy a, b- a vinyl of the song, really? <laughs> Sacred wow. Bones Records, which oh is my a, God. It's a vinyl label that puts out a lot of like horror and movie soundtrack stuff. They are putting out a seven inch that uh, has that the song from the film on one side and then on the other side it's apparently another original song that presumably is david lynch's voice slowed down yes, just like please. the one from the movie yeah so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing that all right i'm gonna read another question oh my god i i seriously have like 10 other things to say about david lynch we should just do an episode yes separate episode be about david lynch because very I can, down I can for pop that. off on that shit I, i'm wearing my david lynch shirt today Whoa! It's directed by David Lynch. Oh yeah, that's a good one. I didn't do that on purpose. I thought for a second you were talking about the skeletons fucking. Yeah, I'm like, also wearing sweatshirt. a sweater with skeletons fucking on it. Jory, you do a really excellent David Lynch. Oh, 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 really? Oh, now I'm on the spot. <laughs> oh, I'm so, you do a terrible David Lynch. <laughs> the secret is to move the cursor up to the word filters. If you get the mouse and position it over the word filters, it's fairly simple to maneuver it down. Go to the rendering category and press lens flare. That's 90% of image making. Are you it's just, a, what? I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt you, good bit. Are you describing the album cover for What Did Jack Do? I am. Go check it out. It's yeah. great. Oh my God, Jory. How can you top that? This one's from Willow. I, I love this question. because we sort of started down this path before. What movie did we see at way too young of an age? Like base and I, the way I interpret this is, what did we see that scarred or I, I took like out, negatively affected us? I took out some of the context of that email just so I could fit it in the document, and I think it was like uh, Willow watched RoboCop, and that mm. messed her up. Um, now that I'm talking, uh, Signs, Signs was my big one. Oh really? I was terrified of aliens as a kid, and that really just like, <sighs> do not like it. I mean, the it doesn't hold up even though I still love it, but the scene of Joaquin Phoenix watching the newsreel from Brazil. Oh, yeah, and it's real like, sca- I saw that in the theater. Yeah. And people jumped at that scene. It's horrifying. I love it. And, you know, Jory and I have talked about this movie at length. I I rewatched it recently and I wasn't as into it, but I still think it's like pretty pretty great movie. I, I, I agree with that. People talk about it like it's a bad M. Night Shyamalan movie. I disagree with that. I think it's, it's a really well-made, interesting film. I hate the message behind it i but i i, I like i had a great time watching it i i feel very torn about that movie because like uh i think especially when it came out like as a as a as a, as a budding young atheist i was like no way man yeah and i mean i mean fuck mel gibson but like the 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 ending of that movie i think it works really well as a christian film i think that the themes, i agree the themes don't resonate with me but i think that that story like that ending last time i watched that movie i think i teared up i think it's like really beautiful and compelling in I, some ways i totally agree like and when i say the message i'm not talking about the religious part for me i didn't think yeah. you were uh, casting a bible no, to no, the ground no, as you w- said that. specifically what i'm talking about is everything happens for a reason uh, and i hate it when people say that i think it's it's damaging and destructive and it, it like can really fuck people up if yeah. something bad happens to you, right? And then you're like, well, what did I do to deserve this? This is, I think, a fundamentally uh, negative message that no matter yeah. what bad shit happens to you, you deserve it. And the other side, too, is anytime something good happens to you, like sometimes random good shit just happens, right? I, so, think, I think to use that movie's plot I don't like that. as an illustration, like it feels like everything happens for a reason. Either God or Mel Gibson's dead wife. Uh, right caused this thing this stack of things to happen that made them able to beat the aliens but uh so maybe like you know it starts to ask questions about like did m night Shyamalan's character kill mel gibson's wife for a reason did this woman die so that then later the aliens could totally did m night Shyamalan's character's life get ruined and he I, i forget he he lives in grief i forget if he's like an alcoholic or something but uh so like that's that's the kind of way that everything happens for a reason gets kind of polluted is it's like well 
I wish my wife didn't die. Like, absolutely. I don't, I don't care if everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. None yeah. of these reasons were why it scared me as a child. I was just like, big scary, big scary alien, <laughs> yeah. alien gonna get me. I get it. For me, it was Time Bandits. I was, I was, I, I didn't see Time Bandits as a kid. I only saw it when I was like a teen. But it still feels like the answer. <laughs> Dude, okay, so two things about that movie. That specifically, I, I forget how old when I I was when I saw it. I must have been under 10. I forget exactly what year it came out. But uh, one... We got got some sick Time Bandit spoilies incoming. Yes, that's right. If you haven't seen this movie yet, you're only 35 or whatever years uh, too late. Um, Number one, it's literally... There's a young child in a bedroom where a group of people show up in his bedroom in the middle of the night and kidnap him. And basically, he's being pursued by that weird disembodied head thing. And the scene where they push the wall and it becomes this big corridor and then tumble into another dimension or whatever the fuck it is. The idea of your safe space, your room as a young child being a potential portal, both incoming and outgoing for bad people and to another dimension where the giant head is going to chase you scared the shit out of me. Also, at the very end, when the kid's parents touch the lump of concentrated evil and blow up. And then Sean Connery as the firefighter is like, later kid. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I like, I was like, wait a minute. The kid's alone. Like his parents just died. And the one like authority figure in the, in the movie, like the friendly authority figure basically just told this kid like, Hey, you're on your own, buddy. Good luck. I'm going to peace out. Oh, (laughs) so upsetting to me. The ending of that movie. I, um, I had, only read about that movie for a really long time before I saw it because I was kind of a Terry Gilliam head. Again, like, wow, how unusual that a <laughs> young white man who likes movies would be really into, into Terry, Terry Gilliam, Gilliam. Who recently oh added himself as a fucking asshole. Recently? Well, <laughs> yeah, no, there was more recent stuff, but he, 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 it just he, seems like he maybe wasn't the best guy for a while. Yeah, he, he got really explicit with it like a year yes. ago when he started on the whole kick that he's still on. And now. then there was something like within the last month, right? Yeah. Where he said something really awful. I can't remember what it was. He's just in general, like all about how white privilege is normal, more or less is his perspective. It seems, and it's, it seems, it's not great. It seems like a disembodied foot should like come out of the sky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stomp that, on him. that guy's saying a lot of the kind of things that get people crushed by 16 ton weights. <laughs> That's not smart. Um, and have a bunch of little uh, cutouts of villagers being oh like, Oh, <laughs> uh, when I was a kid though, and read about that movie, I always assumed that the parents dying was an inciting incident that like led to the kid going off in an adventure. And then it happens at the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. Basically, I, there's there's some thematic resonance to it, but it's mostly just a horrible thing that happens without <laughs> cause. That's exactly right. It's and so wild. I think you can see it as like, you know, ter- he's talked about what is it uh brazil time bandits baron munchausen being part of a trilogy and, and of the, like the... young i i flip that around it should be time bandits brazil munchausen young man middle-aged old man kind of thing uh but so viewed in that context well first of all it's still deeply troubling because it's like all right here's the the young man oh wait he grows up to be an adult and is now in a dystopian you know lobotomy society or whatever <laughs> um but it like Oh, yeah, it just uh, it uh, it's the end of the movie, and it viewed on its own, it's like this kid is just fucked. Yeah, <laughs> so it's upsetting. Such to a weird choice. And then they were trying to shoot a sequel to that movie for years and years that conceptually maybe would have resolved that a little bit, but yeah. who knows? Uh, also, the title's fucking stupid. Time bandits. They don't steal any time. That always bothered me <laughs> as a child. Like, I get it. They're, okay, they're bandits through time. Jory, I get it. I said I get it. I didn't think you didn't. I'm sorry. Yeah, Jory just but... put his hands up defensively. <laughs> it's okay. I lashed out, and I shouldn't have. It was the, it was but... the body language of someone who was being held at gunpoint. I'm really glad um... that 90 percent of this episode is going to be you two apologizing to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of um, things coming into safe spaces and that being scary, and also related to aliens, I was terrified aliens were going to come into my room at night and take me. And this was a debate that I had with my best friend, who was also terrified of aliens, but she lived on a retention pond like her house was right next to a retention what, pond and what, i was like i don't even know what that is it's just like a trash pond <laughs> okay trash pond got it. it yeah um where like all the water drains and we were like okay well if we stay at your house we're safe from the aliens but because you know science logic of you know, aliens ate water mm-hmm. anyway the debate was always if an alien came to you in the night would you rather it be 
one that is very tall, or one that is eye level with you in bed. Oh. So wait, 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 wait. Hold on. You're laying in bed. You're laying in bed. And you can turn your head to the side, and there's an alien head at eye level with you. Yeah. So maybe like a three foot tall, two foot yeah, tall. Yeah, like a little gray, or one that's just like, like... a kid size. Yeah. Um, when I was a kid, I had E.T. bed sheets, and I really liked... Mm. I loved E.T. I love that movie a lot. E.T. was one that I was terrified of. That's understandable. And even though that's one of those things where, like, I knew the text, I knew E.T. was a lovable little fella, but the bed sheets scared me a lot. <laughs> and I would think about, like, E.T. at the foot of my bed, basically <laughs> at, like, laying laying down, looking down, like, seeing E.T. Yeah. down at the, Dude, like, eye level is the worst. I'm just going to... Yeah. the last thing. I'm, I'm fully with you. I'm going to say it. E.T. is terrifying. The character is terrifying. The movie still scares me. I don't like that film. I don't like E.T. I don't like anything about it. I don't see the childhood magic and wonder. I just it's think fucked it's, a, up. No, it's, but that, a, it's a horror show for the entire thing. And I never want to watch it again. That That's movie, my opinion on E.T. That movie is like, it's like a loss of innocence story. Like it's all about how like life is horrible. Yeah, like, I lost my innocence of... when I went to see the movie because of how bad it was. Like I really, you really don't, don't like that. I movie, really huh? hate E.T. It's well, very like, bad. I, I, Jory, I've told you this, but when I was a kid, I loved the, I obsessively rewatched Ron Howard's How the Grinch Stole Christmas, mm-hmm. which I maintain is a good movie <laughs> but there was a tra- <laughs> hold on i maintain that it's a good movie i will die on this hill but there was a trailer for et and i would like force my parents to come back into the room and like stop whatever they were doing and fast forward through the et trailer because oh, it would make me cry that was probably a trailer for the special edition it didn't even have scary guns in it they were it's not the, gu- the guns i wasn't afraid of the guns use the guns to get rid of et <laughs> well yeah exactly that's why the guns were good because that way et dies and you have to deal with them <laughs> the bad right. guys are the protagonists you yes, guys are I both like that. super anti <laughs> E.T. That's right. And don't get me wrong, like, like I, I really like, like, there's, like, divorced family energy all over that movie. Like, there's so much relatable stuff. Deeply just, traumatizing like, to me as a child. The the creature or the divorce? Every single fucking thing about that movie. I hate the whole thing. I can't I, defend any of it. The only thing as a, mo- as a kid that genuinely scared me, and I think it's just because the movie works really well, is, like, when you see E.T., like, ashen white dog poop, like, dying <laughs> experimental facility like yeah. that, that's no. that's bad like that that was awful yes we, we, and i have really mixed feelings about that because i wanted him to die <laughs> yeah, you want to see him die and go to hell but, but... that particular death is horrifying <laughs> yeah i, I do agree. want the sequel et goes to hell <laughs> it's like a freddy versus jason yeah kind of thing. oh yeah okay, yeah should... well his his he does get dragged by freddy krueger into the dirt at the end of that movie setting it up for a sequel and uh by the way i as a kid I saw nothing but movies that I saw too early because hmm. I, I watched like a ton of R-rated horror movies when I was a kid. No, I couldn't handle it. Like I, I, I loved it when I was a kid. Like I was all about like slasher movies and stuff. Uh, the only one that really traumatized me and it's kind of hack to be afraid of clowns, but Killer Clowns from Outer Space got you know me what? real good yes. when I was a kid. Yes, 100% yes. Really fuck. I recognize it's supposed to be a comedy. Yeah. When I saw it, it was on HBO all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I saw it when I was whatever, not even that young, probably like 12. Yes, completely fucked me up. Not yeah. funny, just scary. I, I have a theory about that stuff where like I think that horror comedy especially for a child is uh when when you're not very versed in the language of movies i think is way scarier than actual horror because somebody's death in a horror movie i mean sometimes the violence can be pretty fetishistic in horror movies but it's treated with a drama that makes a death make sense in context Mm -hmm. whereas the deaths in those horror comedies always feel so kind of crass and flip like when the guy like the cop gets used like a puppet right oh i remember that i definitely remember that did not want that to happen to me well i think also (laughs) with kids like they can you know kids who are i don't know pretty maybe seven or eight by that point they've seen enough stuff most of them that they can appreciate what the beats or rhythms of a comedy versus not horror but They've seen a bunch of comedies. And so when you see something that has the formal structure and beats of a comedy, but people are getting eviscerated, it's a real brain fuck. Oh, yeah. It got me real bad at that age. Um, I, and when I think about uh, Return of the Living Dead, I'm like, that is like, that's like skirting an R rating. Like that yes. movie, that movie oh, yeah. almost is an R. Like there's some, like there's like full frontal nudity in that movie. But uh that movie like also scared me a lot as a kid just because like all of the death and gore and stuff is so like sudden and violent because it's supposed to be camp and fun yeah. but as a kid it, it it scared me way more than like ever any other slasher movie did totally it got me 
Uh, so we're going to take a break so we can uh, drink some water and we're going to uh, have a word from our sponsors who we're super grateful uh, to have like so early supporting our stuff. So here we go. I was. Hey, uh, hey, everyone. My name is Jory. I was having problems with uh, Bluetooth connectivity on my headphones uh, and I was trying to listen to music and it kept going boop, boop, and cutting out on me and I was having a lot of trouble with it. So uh I I went uh I went to Best Buy and I got a I got a range extender. It's a generic brand range range extender for Bluetooth, but uh I've been having a lot of success with it and I think you will too. Uh so uh go to bluetoothrangeextender.com uh slash Layton and uh you're gonna have less problems. You're gonna be able to listen to music in the shower, uh your phone's gonna be in your bedroom and the speaker's gonna be in the bathroom and you're not gonna have a, you're not gonna have any more problems with Bluetooth. I think it'll work real good for you, like it did for me. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. <laughs> My hand is covered in saliva from God. like trying to. Not... <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> I'm honored. I'm honored. Oh my god, my stomach hurts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the, I, can't, I can't come back from this <laughs> looking up and just seeing two tears rolling down oh, his so cheeks holy shit oh. <laughs> I'm so honored you Ow. guys <laughs> I don't know how uh, that's <laughs> genius I don't know what else to say it's Bri- <laughs> Brian needs a moment oh, shit oh. wow that I'm, I'm... so funny <laughs> I'm honored. Thank you both. <laughs> the bee boop. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Oh, Jesus. Okay. I'm and a, that was a great <laughs> ad break. Let's yes. get a back very into important sponsor. <laughs> All right, Layden, do you want to read the Yeah, the next sure. Question? Do, do um one? this question is from Andrew. On what basis do you decide which movies are worth seeing in a movie theater versus waiting for a wide home release? Uh, for me, I, I have weird viewing habits because of uh, what my job is. So I pretty much only go see movies during the day mm. because at night, you know, we have a little kid, so we need a babysitter if we're going to go out. I can't think, can't, I can't. I feel like I'm Gene Hagen and Singing in the Rain. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, okay. She's the one that goes, I can't, I can't stand, stand him. him. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, it's. The classic is she's a silent uh, film star, and then they get the talking and whatever. Millennials yeah. like me, we just haven't seen the classics. Layton is literally ten years younger than you are. Oh yeah, we have an interesting like uh, ten year age gap between. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Totally. We got a good. We got How a old good, are you, uh, Decade range covered. I'm 31, and I'm 44, and you're 22. Yep. Anyway, so uh, I can't think of the last time I thought there was a movie worth getting a babysitter for. Uh, so often Rachel and I will just go see movies at like 11 a.m. in the middle of the day while Audrey's in school if we if we can. So for me, it's just like the last movie I saw in the theater was Uncut Gems because Hell yeah. I wanted to see it. I heard great things. I loved it. And it was I saw like a 10 a.m. showing at the it was in the dome. Also at the if you guys very L.A. specific thing, but there's an amazing like movie theater in Hollywood called the Cinerama Dome. I will see anything in that thing. It's from the 60s. It's fucking awesome. Yeah, there's a veggie and grill right outside. Hell yeah, there is. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, I've been to that veggie grill many times. Like So anyway, if a, if a decent movie is playing in the Dome, I'm going to go see it. So for me, it's just like, do I want to see it? Do I have time during the week? All right, I'll, I'll go. I'll go check it out. But it has, it's, it's, you know, maybe it's like once every other month do I actually go to a theater to see a movie. Yeah, at the most. Interesting. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, this is again much more LA specifics. So to try to keep it brief, it is exciting living in a city where they play early run, first run movies that are, you know, like art housey and stuff like that. Like I, I, it happened to me several times where I didn't realize I was doing it, where I was like seeing like A24 movies mm-hmm. like weeks before they open in like more uh, extended runs. Uh, and that type of thing is very exciting in LA because when you see that stuff in Ohio, uh, you are guaranteed to be the only person in the theater for the three days they will show mm-hmm. it before it gets pulled. Right. But here, like 
uh, seeing uncut gems just like surrounded by people who were just like reacting in like such a because yeah, yeah. you know like chatter in movie theaters can be kind of annoying but for me it almost always enhances the movie and really like, yeah oh, I'm the exact opposite uh, it depends shut up as far as I'm concerned Sorry. <laughs> it depends yes. on the genre of movie and the quality of the movie if it is a dog shit film and everybody is on the same page like I went to see The Grudge recently the the new one <sighs> <laughs> We, you went. You saw that in the theater. Yes. So that's. Uh, I don't mean to hijack your thing. No, you're totally fine. But my main criteria is terrible horror movies or uh, any sort of a twenty four movie or whatever is fun for me to eat, like an upsetting amount of edibles and then go see. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that was the grudge. Um, uh, we we thought we were going to be the only people in the theater, and then maybe like six seven other people show up and then by the midway point none of us are like they were they were screaming at jump scares like first half and then you could just hear them like groaning the moment it cuts to credits everybody stands up and goes shit ass fucking motherfucking shit movie (laughs) uh that's great are you sure they weren't groaning because they were afflicted with the grudge Oh, that's a good point Uh, that's the sound of someone who hates the movie they're watching (laughs) Um, that, that's that's like, also that's a little grudge noise. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's a little grudge. Noise. A little grudge. <laughs> uh, I also this is uh, this feels like revisionist history to say, but like usually people usually say that in front of something that ends up getting edited out of a podcast. Uh, um, it's a <laughs> no uh, promises, Jordan. <laughs> <story. laughs> um, I feel like I've seen a lot of movies that are like absolute dog shit on dvd and the main one that i'm thinking of is um steven spielberg's the war of the worlds which, <laughs> oh yeah which I is like that. on video yeah. it's an absolutely horror i think it's a horrible movie you get a little bit of that tommy cruise yeah yeah and he's like the least believable every man like he's an every man divorced dad and like nothing about it works it's really frustrating but um that movie in a theater uh was really fun just because Mm -hmm. of like spectacle and bombast and stuff like that and there are movies like that that i think are made exclusively to be seen on a big screen and that just die on on video it was especially hard with (laughs) with comedies too right like almost every comedy is better in a theater with people who are who are loving it rather than the way i watch them which is alone at 11 p.m well you know while my child is sleeping in the next room yeah and they're still sure. funny but like instead you of laughing it. you do the like hard nose exhale like yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> i've been trying really hard the last couple of times i've seen movies that have comedy elements in theaters to writing is so hard it's so hard to write stuff and then probably as an actor i can't even imagine the amount of pressure when the camera's on you to like say a line that you've probably been sitting with for weeks or months and it's just not funny to you anymore and deliver it like it's funny. Well, and so, 30 times in a row. Yeah, right. totally. Yeah, yeah. So like I've been trying to go really hard and just like really open myself up to enjoying laugh lines in movies when I'm in theaters recently. I, I like I watched Ghostbusters 2016 again and I was like, oh, this movie's not that funny. Because like when I was in theaters, when that movie came out first run and I watched it, I was like laughing the whole time. Like it's so mm-hmm. full of lines that when I was in the theater with a crowd of people who had like a north of lukewarm response to it, it was like really, I had a lot of fun watching it. Like, yeah, it's the the plot doesn't hold together, but like I was having a, a lot of fun watching that movie when it first came mm-hmm. out. That, that's what I was like immediately thinking of as you were talking about that. Uh, yeah, like I, I was really trying to go into that one because I was excited for it and, you know. Yep. I, there's something about, I, and this is such a pretentious take, but ever since I got into like writing professionally, bad writing destroys me and it makes me so mad, especially with comedies where it's like, that's not a joke. Just because you said fuck doesn't make it a joke. Like uh, Ready or Not, which was a recent one that made me very angry. Yeah. Where it's like, look at all these people who are dressed up and they say shit and fuck. Like, yeah. That's not a joke. You can't use somebody saying fuck as a punchline. It's not funny. Yeah. I think you realize my band does fuck. exactly this like, every <laughs> single song. Yeah, but you guys are talented and do actual jokes. 
I say I will say of Ready or Not that it has routinely very good performances. I think everybody does a pretty good job in that movie. Yeah, like, uh, Adam like Brody, Christian Brune a lot. Yeah, uh, S- Samara Weaving, like uh, you know, good. Yeah, I guess I'm psyched about Samara Weaving becoming a thing because she she's she's a lot of fun. She was really delightful, even though that movie was just I wanted to pull all my teeth out. Yeah, so. maybe you weren't ready. Anyway, um, Ooh. doing that bit multiple times <laughs> yeah. in one episode <laughs> feels kind of rough. <laughs> feels like my wheelhouse Jordan. I, ref- I refuse to apologize for this that's the difference yeah. <laughs> ira glass to apologize for this brian what's the next question yeah great <laughs> jory i like that <laughs> you shouldn't uh let's see hold on we're gonna need to you sucking up to jory well i have to he's my boss all right so our next question is from natalie who asks, what are all your thoughts on the Oscars right now? Layton, I'm going to go to you first on this. No. Jory? No. I'm also no. I think the only the only level of excitement I can muster is for the On Cinema Oscar special, which I'll be able to watch live for the first time, which is very exciting. It's it's really exciting, yeah. And the amount of legal trouble that they're in right now will make it a lot of, a lot of fun. The it's Oscars really are in legal trouble? No, On Cinema is in legal oh, trouble. Oh, On Cinema. I didn't know about that. The Oscars are, are, are constantly in peril, though, I guess. Well, yeah, for sucking you... too much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Got him. Are you too <laughs> far away from the mic? I don't know. That sounds better. Christian asks, do you have strong feelings, positive or negative, about a film adaptation of a piece of work that you had a personal connection with? Hmm. Hmm. I, uh, I think one of the, one of the most like profitably adapted writers of all time is somebody who I'm pretty fond of, which is uh, Philip K. Dick. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's like such an unbelievable range of quality in the adaptations of his work, uh, where like obviously Blade Runners a really great movie, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's pretty pretty loosely adapted from the source material. But um, uh, I I'm a pretty big fan of um I'm not a I'm not a Linklater head in general, but the the Scanner Darkly movie uh, starring oh yeah I wanted Keanu to see Reeves, that was that yeah. was that good I I like that movie a whole lot partially just because. It's like the only thing that's adapted from Philip K. Dick that actually uses a lot of his prose, mm-hmm. and he's he his prose is just like so beautiful that that movie is full of just like little moments that are just like so graceful and so wonderful, mm. delivered by Keanu Reeves impeccably. Uh, partially just because he's playing like a neo type character where he can be like basically like out of his body and still be delivering the lines fine just because he's playing like a drugged out guy who's got like disassociative identity oh. disorder uh but then also at the same time you've got like paycheck and uh oh the, yeah the colin farrell <laughs> total recall and which i uh, never saw it's like... a rough watch it's so well especially because like i grew up watching the original, original too right. speaking of movies that i was too young oh, for i, I... <laughs> I was terrified of the scene in the original where the bad the, guy gets his fingers sliced off. Oh, yeah, yeah. See you at the party, Richter. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like all the eyes bugging out and stuff, too, got me real good. Yep. I, I think I had nightmares about that when I was a kid. Um, and then um, also, it's not a movie, so sorry. I'm really that's, sorry. No, Jory, that's fine. I'm so sorry. Just, if that's fine. If it doesn't fit. That's fine. I believe in you. Go ahead. Um, the Man in the High Castle Amazon series is just like that – that book is a little bit problematic in some ways because like even if it's a negative fantasy it still is a little weird to fantasize about the nazis winning kind of like the you know benioff and weiss wanting to do a story about the confederacy winning right the civil war and it's like why why do you want to fantasize about that that's interesting but uh man in the high castle the tv series so boring by the end of the so f- boring it, it, it's it's extremely boring and it's in like really weird taste but it also just like by the end of the first episode it has completely missed the boat on what makes the book interesting um yeah not to get too deep into spoilies but the book is just like a very philip k dick like existential what is reality and what what do characters do if they're living in a false reality Mm -hmm. and in the book basically where it ends is well they get really bummed about it (laughs) <laughs> and in the in the in the TV series, by the end of the first episode, it's made very clear that the fact that they are living in a false reality and they observe a reality that is not their own immediately becomes the Nazis are going to try to invade this other reality. 
and it's like they well, kick first, off. I didn't the even plot. get to that point. It's, in it, it's, like... it's unbearable. It's really rough. I I, I started reading the book just because I've been I, I kind of ex- I was reading a lot of Stephen King books and then I kind of exhausted the ones that I knew I would really like and I was mm-hmm. like ah, I should get in some other big ones that I haven't read and I could not get more than a few chapters into that one. It just didn't didn't grab me yeah his 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 work is so 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 slow it's like a really slow read and he he is not he's really interesting because he's like in some ways he's a really humane writer but not in a way that really communicates to the reader Mm -hmm. like right away in that book you start spending time with like shildan right the antiques guy and like it's like so slow to get into because he's just like not trying to ingratiate you to this character at all it's 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 a really interesting that's an interesting way to put it because usually when i think of uh you know authors or directors not trying to ingratiate a character to you at all it's like somebody who's explicitly unlikable which is a thing that i Mm. love Mm -hmm. um i love a thing that actively alienates you from the protagonist of like this person's a piece of shit enjoy (laughs) yeah yeah whereas in that book it's just like the tawdry details of what they're doing day to day and like you spend like there's like four chapters where he's introducing characters to you in ways that do not make them interesting or appealing characters at all yeah it's like oh we're trying to buy this thing we're a couple we're gonna go buy this thing yeah the the stephen king thing reminded me of i guess it it means kind of it's more of a mini series than a movie but i really love the I think it was on Hulu, 112263 mm. series. Oh, I've neither James, watched or James E. Franco? Yeah, yeah, James Franco. I, I, I can't remember the name of anyone else in it, but I am a sucker for time travel stories. I absolutely love them. Interesting. Uh, and the idea behind this one is basically a guy discovers a portal that takes him back to, I forget exactly when, it's like 1959 or 1960, and gets obsessed with stopping the Kennedy assassination. And, you know, of course, he has to spend a few years in the past to, like, get up to that. And he falls in love and it's this whole thing. And I had not read the book before I saw the series, watched the series, thought it was just really touching and interesting, had enough time travel stuff that was cool and some historical stuff that was great. Uh, Really nice little period piece, too. Takes place in the, you know, late 50s, early 60s. Um, and then I read the book after I don't read a lot of Stephen King. I know people love him. I have never never been like super into him. I read the uh, the Dark Tower, you know, one kind of when those were coming out, at least for the first few years. Liked it. Didn't love it. Read eleven twenty two sixty three, which is, again, one of those like fifteen hundred page Stephen King books. But it takes you an hour to read because he's such a great compelling yeah. writer. And the book was also really fun and interesting and slightly different than the uh, than the adaptation. But I thought they were both successful and and. and really well done and i know people have varying opinions on james franco but like he was he was really really good in this Hmm. yeah Yeah, i was uh i started watching i don't even know why i seen uh, oh my friend was like the show is really really fucked up you should watch it and that's pretty much the one way that you can get me into a thing Mm -hmm. um the outsider on hbo uh as an adaptation of the book I watched the first episode and I was like, oh, yeah, it was good. And so I read the entire book in like at one sitting or whatever. And, you know, classic Stevie King syndrome of halfway through, it just completely falls apart. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the show, Jason Bateman, great director. I did not know this. Oh, really? Um, it feels a little bit like either in the editing or the cinematography, it feels a little bit rookie. Like the man loves like a rack focus, but cannot get the subject in focus in a way that's really distracting Mm -hmm. um like lots of weird choices but i had to stop watching because the script is like abysmal um and that drives me nuts but i think my poll in terms of um adaptation of a thing that you have an emotional connection to when i was a kid off-brandedly my favorite book was little women i think because i was just Mm -hmm. like oh emotions it's oh they just love each other and as any sort of like tomboyish, like bookish kid, like Joe is, you know, the ultimate <clears throat> uh, book girl. And I watched the Greta Gerwig one recently. I had like a nice rolling mist the whole time. Mm-hmm. It's a lovely film. Uh, their performances are really great. Uh, Florence Pugh is, uh, Amy is literature's best brat. She tears it up. She's like the high point of the movie, Til- Timothy Chalamet. I did not understand the hype for him. And immediately I was like, okay, I get it. Oh, All right. Cool. Yeah, I've um, only seen him in Lady Bird. And that's I still thing. haven't seen Lady Bird, but um, I think... It's the best. It's so good. Okay, it's yeah. Really I've, I've been told that I'll really like it. Um, but Little Women, like, I think I want to evaluate movies on what they make me feel. And it made me feel a lot. There were so many, like, technical, formal writing, editing, directing issues with it that really bothered me. It has, like, the worst ADR I've seen in a movie in a really long time. 
and I'll let it go. I don't care. It was a great movie and I enjoyed it a lot. Cool. That rules. Yeah. I I still haven't seen Doolittle, but I'm really curious are about Doolittle. Are you Doolittle. wait? Let's are go you, see it. Are you planning are you actually planning on seeing Doolittle? I mean, maybe we should, but uh everything I've heard about that movie was that like virtually every line of dialogue is ADR and was clearly <laughs> written by punch-up writers. Well, did like, they get actual animals to talk? Is really my question. I I don't know where to begin with this. So then it's probably it's probably ADR. Like if they here here's here's a quick diagnostic, Jory. If they are showing you a dog and the dog is talking, that's something that was not said by the dog on set. I think we should move into our final segment, segment or our only actual segment so far of this episode, which yeah. is peaches and lemons. Do you want to describe what this is? So, um, my aunt and uncle and my nieces do this thing every night at dinner where they go around the table and they each do peaches and lemons, which is a lemon is one thing during the day that they were frustrated by or that they didn't like. And then three peaches, which are things that you were excited about or grateful for, or generally just feel good about. So jury, I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh yeah, really. Well, so I go it's over one, here and burn. one one lemon, three peaches, right? That's what we're doing. Yeah, three peaches. Also a great song by Neutral Milk Hotel. Mm. Mm. How earnest are we being with this? You can or... be as earnest as you want. Yeah. Like it, it's not it's not a bit. You can be honest. So, yeah, this is like replacing the emotional check in from the live shows. Oh, I am oh. gonna play the no matter what you say. <laughs> that's a good bit. Recording immediately afterwards to undercut anything you say that's serious. <laughs> so just bear that in mind. All right. So that's a good bit. So the air is going to be taken out of what <laughs> I, I know, say, I, I would, regardless I, of what happens. I would never do that to you, Jory. Did that Did that pick up? Should I do that again louder this time? Should it's I do just, it right into the mic? It's great. Keep going. Um, <laughs> I would say uh, t- just today or? Today, yeah. So uh, a real lemon is that uh, I just like woke up with an awful tension headache, which has been happening to me a lot lately. I feel, mm. like, I've been, uh, I feel like I've been having a lot of nightmares that I don't remember. So like when I've been like waking up right in the middle of a REM state, I've been waking up realizing I was just having a nightmare. But for the most part, I've been waking up with like a body tension that's making me realize that I was having nightmares. And I woke up with that today. So that was a little bit of a lemon. Oh. Uh, but are you? do you feel better now? Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling really, really good now. I've been having a lot of fun here I with have, my friends. I've been having fun with you here. Wow. Thank you, Brian. I'm not having fun. <laughs> That's my lemon. I got two lemons now. Right. Uh, I just got one peach from my boy, Brian. Yeah. Uh, That's not how this works. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What are your peaches? Um, as much as I... I get very self-conscious about this kind of thing for some reason because I like to be emotionally open, but at the same time, it's hard for me to be like... It feels like maybe it's a little self ingratiating to say peaches aloud, and that's more of like a me thing. Than I, it is a... I get it, but I'm giving you permission to be grateful. Um, give Jory, give yourself permission to be grateful. Denied. Great. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I got a lot to be excited about right now. Um, got work project stuff that has been going really, really well, and I feel like I've had a really nice ability lately. Uh, I'm just going to make that my first peach then. Great. I love I, it. I was transitioning into another thought, which was that I feel like lately uh, I've had a real uh, positive ability to turn lemons into peaches. Oh, that's a good one. Which yeah. is a tortured uh, fusion of two different turns that's of it, phrase. That's a meta peach. Oh. Yeah, that's like a delicious uh, Starbucks peach green tea lemonade. Yeah. yeah. Which I was just drinking. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was really ruining the acoustics of this podcast uh, the cl- clinky ice <laughs> um i don't think it actually was the uh lately like i feel like i've had a really good ability where when i get bad news i've been able to see the silver linings of the black clouds mm. within seconds and i've like it's like a little bit rare for me because i can be kind of a pessimist so it's been really exciting to feel developing i've had a lot of that in the last couple of days though that like um i have a big tendency to pro- procrastinate because i just like get obsessed with like the negative downsides of something. Word. And I feel like in the yes. last couple of weeks, I've been noticing a lot. Like I think about the bad thing and then almost immediately I find an advantage in it. That's going to make doing that thing or dealing with that thing, an interesting growing experience or an opportunity to, uh, find like growth. If not, if not a personal thing, then like, uh, finding an advantage to it that will make a work problem uh, get easier because I'll, you know, what's the 
awful shit is the mother of invention. I don't remember the expression. Necessity. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so there's, a, I think that's a second peach. That's two peaches. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I have a peach that is relevant to, to sayings, but I'll come up with that in which, a minute. Okay. Uh, should I finish one more peach? Yeah, yeah sure. that's how this works. Um, I'm not thinking of a, a, I'm not thinking of a third one. It's not that things aren't going really well. I'm just having, a, I'm, I'm freezing up. That's we, fine. All we right. Can, we can loop back around. Yeah. All right. Uh, Layton, do you want to go? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, my lemon was that I went to Starbucks on the way here, and the parking lot was one of the worst parking lots I've been at. Mm. This is two episodes straight where I've complained about parking lots. Mm. But um, yeah, I, I, I just hate drivers, and I hate cars, and I hate having a car and driving around in a car, and then you've got like four people in front of you, so the moment somebody backs out, they're like, ooh, that one's mine, and you got to wait your tr- Bullshit. Um wish i could fly or uh, you know just like take take flight like in second life um, hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah i was that the whole time you were saying that i was like this is the most unrelatable thing i've ever heard and then you turned it around right at the last second i've been watching the new picard show and they had a scene the second episode where they're just like there's a big set of transporter doorways right in front of starfleet headquarters and people are just like materializing and walking out and it's the fucking best that sounds Dope. Right, do don't have to deal oh, with right. the 101. Don't have to deal with the two. Don't nope. don't have to deal with the five. Get a I new love transporter the, and go. People you, love LA specifics. Oh, they love it. I mean, it's like uh, you know, sort of the fetish of like bimboification, and then you got LAification where you just like never shut up about parking lots and traffic yep. and the highway. Anyway, three peaches. Um, I went on my balcony this morning, and maybe followed me out, and she just immediately goes for the patch of sun and just like curls up, which is lovely. Um, my second one is also dog and sun related. Uh, Brian's dog Coco was just rolling around in the grass in a patch of sunlight, and that really does the heart good. She gets active for at the most five minutes per day, and you, you, we caught her at exactly the, that moment. It was beautiful seeing it in the wild. Uh, we need some uh, David Attenborough uh, yeah. commentary. Um, and then my third one is that Jory and I are hanging out tonight, right? Yes, and I, now I feel like this should have been my third one. I fucked up. It's fine. Fuck it's you. Fine. <laughs> we'll get good food and like uh, wreck some shit in Dead by Daylight or something. So I'm excited about that because I haven't been able to hang out with Jory in a while outside of work. Oh, no. yeah. That's great. Yeah, you're not invited. That's fine. I can't come anyway. Uh, my lemon. What do I have? Oh, okay. It's also worth noting that it is not nighttime. It, it's like 1.20. Yeah. <laughs> Here's my lemon. This is a minor one. Uh, every morning at Audrey, every Friday morning at Audrey's kindergarten, they have what they call community reading where you can bring in books and you read with the kids. And I was crushing it reading this one book and the three kindergartners in my group could not have been less into what I was giving them. Like they, I was, you know, hamming it up and delivering these lines in the book. And I thought it was being really funny. And these three fucking little kids just like stone faced no response and one of them walked away in the middle of it too whoa really uncool got a walk out wait what was the book uh that book was the detective dog by julia donaldson well that sounds like your first problem it's a great book <laughs> julia donaldson author of the gruffalo <laughs> and a million other things she's awesome uh this book is 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 great she's one of the few writers out there that actually writes things that scan well when you read them mm. uh which is my number one pet peeve with children's books um but, gotta get that flow and i was i was in the flow i was hitting the lines i was doing voices and these kindergartners of which my daughter was one not into it and uh was she the one who walked out no yeah, she was, was not it was, a, it, was, wasn't it was a it. different one yeah anyway that's my lemon hmm. uh peaches uh also you know what this is also kindergarten related uh i when i was i had to go to audrey's school yesterday for a meeting and i saw one of her kindergarten teachers in the parking lot and the teacher said, I just want to tell you something Audrey said to me today. I had asked, I was doing a thing. I forget what she was talking about, polar bears or some shit. And uh, I asked the class for if anybody had any questions. And a bunch of the kids just started saying random stuff. And this is what the teacher said to me. She said, but your daughter, Audrey, said, guys, those are comments, not questions. A comment is when you say what you think about something. But a question is when you ask about something. And then, and I was like, oh, and then then the teacher told me, 
that she gave Audrey a little high five. Uh, and I asked Audrey about it later and she repeated that, you know, close enough to verbatim that I was like, oh yeah, okay, that that actually happened. Whenever a five-year-old tells you that they said something in the past, you can't believe them because they have yeah. memories like Siv's. And also <laughs> chronic shower argument five-year-olds oh yeah yeah i totally feel like when a 35 year old tells you they said something badass it almost certainly didn't happen yeah <laughs> but when the you know the teacher plus the daughter does the same thing i was like oh this, that rules multiple witnesses yeah all right uh another another peach uh i've been watching the boys on amazon and it's really good yeah i really like it yeah I... what, you don't like it no it's not that i don't like it i just uh i think that um I think my deconstructive superheroes phase ended a while back. And that doesn't make me special or better or smart. It's just like I was reading books that were all about that stuff like 10 years ago. Uh, and so yeah. and I believe the book it's based on is from 10 years ago. But it's a it's an interesting adaptation that goes play. I, I haven't read the original, so I can't compare it. But it it does things that surprise me. That rules. And doesn't feel like the same boring retread of what if superheroes were dicks kind of stuff even though that is like if you really boiled it down that's what it is but i think generally it's it's really interesting and 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 well done that's awesome i think the way that was pitched to me was like leighton you'll like it there's gore There is gore. It's it's like bad CGI gore. The oh, effects are not. Oh, come on. Yeah. It, okay, like... listen up. If you're going to recommend me a thing on the merit of gore, better be practical special effects or get the fuck out. Oh, it's, it's got to be practical. Definitely not. If you show me that CGI blood splatter, no. If that no. that's if if there's a CGI blood splatter, it better be ironic, baby. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah. And this is not. I mean, it, it it like it's clearly meant to be funny at times, but some of it is serious. It's also nice. Elizabeth Shue is in it, and she. It's great to see her. I haven't seen her in a while. She maybe is doing a ton of stuff I don't know about, but uh, you know, she's someone that I grew up watching in movies, and you know, yeah, she's doing this too, and she's great. I, in it. I can't second. It's great to see her because I have not. I do. I have not had that experience. I have not seen her in forever, so it sounds like it would be great to see her. Yeah, it is wonderful. Uh, and the other one, I might have even said this the last episode, but it's another parenting thing. Rachel is away this week, and I'm having Dad Audrey time all week. Just me and my daughter, Aww. and I love it. We get to read books at night and cuddle in the morning, and it's kind of just the two of us for a little bit. And it's really, it feels like a special little, you know, moment that we're sharing for for five days. I love doing stuff just me and Audrey, and uh, it's just a, it's a nice little thing. And we're kind of, it's like a, we're in it together. We'll survive till Mom gets back, uh, kind of thing. We had Commander Meowch from Twerp over the other night on Wednesday. And we ate dinner, and he and Audrey played Captain Toad Treasure Tracker for, like, an hour and a half. Like, way too long. Oh, uh, delightful. And it was really cute and really fun. That's So it's adorable. nice to have that moment with my daughter. Yeah, those stories are always oh. delightful. Uh, Jory, thank you so much for being here with us. This is the second episode of this podcast. We're still very much figuring it out, but it means a lot to me that you, who are is such a, a dear friend and so funny and talented, would, would show up and, and be a part of this. Yeah, especially at like 11 a.m. on a Friday when you have work that you're excited about doing. And, you know, we really cherish you. You're one of my favorite people, and I'm wow. honored to be your friend. And I would really love to have you on again in a future episode. I think that would be delightful. And I'm happy to yeah. tell you guys, I don't mean to pander, but peach number three right here. <gasps> I thought you guys were going to pop big time for that, and you didn't. (laughs) I'm really worried about this. Well, yes. I think you crushed it, Jory. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate that a lot. Also, that ad break was fantastic. I mean, it wasn't Jory, but it was a very good. I'm so happy with our sponsors. um, Yeah. No, I'll definitely be giving that. Uh, Bluetooth extender company. <laughs> uh, whoever, whoever, whoever did that ad read did say their name aloud, and I think it was pretty similar to my own name. So. Uh, you realize that that website that was said is something that we either have to edit out or purchase. It's probably pornography already, <laughs> as of this recording. All right, bye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Leighton Knight is produced by Brian Wecht and Leighton Gray. For more information, visit LeightonKnight.com. That's L-E-I-G-H-T-O-N-N-I-G-H-T.com. Our next live show is on Monday, March 23rd at the Lodge Room here in Los Angeles. You can visit LeightonKnight.com for tickets. Also, please follow us on social media. On Twitter, we're at LeightonKnight, and on Instagram, at Leighton underscore Knight.